Good evening and welcome to the Explorers Club. I'm Daryl Hawk. I'm very excited to have with me this evening world-renowned mountaineer and photographer Jimmy Chin. Jimmy, welcome to the Explorers Club. Thank you. It's great to be here, Daryl. <laughs> well, we're really excited to see your presentation tonight and I've been following your work for years and um, I wanted to ask you, Jimmy, a little bit um, about your childhood. Um, tell us a little bit about your childhood because that usually reveals where this great passion maybe from mountaineering and photography developed. Right. Well, it might not because I grew up in Mankato, Minnesota. Uh, my parents were both from China, so I was a first generation um, Chinese kid growing up in Minnesota, which is not exactly a hotbed for mountaineers or photographers. Well, maybe photographers, but not mountaineers. Um, but I did grow up uh, doing a lot of sports. I swam competitively for 10 years, and um, I also trained in the martial arts for a very long time, 10, 12 years, um, and competed in both, and also uh, started playing the violin when I was three and a half. You know, my parents were really into like getting me to do um, a lot of different things mm. and especially academics. And right. so they pushed pretty hard and, uh, but you know, I always had a sense of like, you know, wanting to escape Minnesota <laughs> and maybe <laughs> that's what drove me to <laughs> explore the rest of the world. Will you still play the violin? Uh, I don't, um, I've thought about going back to it. I picked up the guitar in high school, which was okay. way cooler, you know, yeah, but yeah. I did play the violin <laughs> through high school. Yeah. Well, where did this great love of, uh, and passion for photography and climbing all come from? You know, and which came first, by the way? Yeah, I think that I had a lot of drive, even from a very young age, and I think sports really pushed me to kind of have that discipline and, like, you know, when you start something that, that young, I think that it's kind of ingrained in you. Like, I found a lot of satisfaction out of the competition and that physical kind of, you know, life. Uh, but in college, I found um, climbing. And so I'm a late, you know, compared to kids these days, I started climbing when I was 17. Okay. But I did start skiing when I was 10. And I loved skiing. And that was kind of the reward. I got to go skiing after I finished playing the violin and going to swim practice and going to martial arts practice. And, you know, um, so I always loved skiing. And I, my parents traveled a lot in the summertime because they worked at the university and we would go out west. And the first time I saw the mountains in Montana, in Glacier National Park, it was pretty much decided for me. I was like, well, why wouldn't you live here, you know? And so uh, I just really, really wanted to move west and into the mountains, and climbing mountains really became an obsession once I started yeah. rock climbing. That's interesting you use that word obsession because I know a number of world-renowned mountaineers and I think they might describe it the same way. It does almost become an obsession, doesn't it? It doesn't almost. <laughs> it is an obsession. It's, you live and breathe it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As they say, you have to feed the rat. <laughs> feed and, the rat, yeah. Um, right. You know. Well, what about the photography? How did that all come into play? So, as a photographer, I, you know, I never really uh, thought about being a professional photographer. I studied international relations in college, and um, essentially, you know, and I grew up looking at National Geographic, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so did I. I had, you know, we had every single one that we ever got, and um, so, I, you know, it was there. But it wasn't a dream. And then when I started climbing, a good friend of mine was a photographer and he wanted to become a professional photographer and he showed me how to shoot his camera and we were in Yosemite and I took a photo with it. And essentially, he tried to sell his photography and this company bought one photo and it was the photo that I took. Hmm. And so they paid me $500, which I thought was just an insane amount of money <laughs> because I was living out of my car. Sure. And 
$500, I could live for like several months. And so I wish I could say that I had this passion for photography beforehand, but really photography for me at the moment when I started shooting was to feed the rat, <laughs> was to allow me to keep climbing. Okay. Um, and then over the years that evolved because I started looking at other photographers and I started, you know, studying, you know, all the great photographers and I met some really influential mm -hmm. people in my life, Galen Rowell being oh, one of I them. Oh, I admired him greatly. And, yeah. uh, and that really propelled me into yeah. that world. Who coined the phrase, feeding the rat? <laughs> Al Alvarez. Al Alvarez. Yeah. Oh, okay. He wrote a book called Feeding the Rat. I see. He was a climber. Yep. Well, tell us briefly a little bit about maybe a few of your most memorable climbs, because you've had so many great ones. Yeah. I'd say the highlights of my career, some of them weren't even climbing. Probably one of the best trips I've ever done was crossing the Changtang Plateau with Galen Rowell. Oh, I read about that. Yeah, and Rick Ridgway. And, and I was Conrad. just there myself. And uh, it's beautiful. I love place. it up there. Yeah. And, and weren't you, were you with George Shell around that? He wasn't on it, but it was inspired by some right. research that he was doing, and we were basically following the migration of the Shiru, the yes, danger. Yes, George Schaller is very passionate yeah. about that. So, so you got to travel with Gail and Raul. And Rick and Conrad, and I learned a ton. They were like incredible mentors, and that was my first uh, foot in the door at National Geographic. Right. Um, other probably really memorable But that trips. wasn't really a climb, per se, was it? No, it was no. a traverse of the chain. A, a traverse, yeah. right. Um, what about climbs? What, what, what climbing, one or two climbs stand out in your mind the most? Probably, the th there's a few. Two of them are spectacular failures. One was the Alpine-style ascent attempt on the north face of Everest. Um, and that was a pretty heavy trip. Uh, Why was it heavy? Just we had some really close calls and, you know, there were probably a couple of times when we probably would, shouldn't have made it out of there and we did. Uh, Who were you with? I was with Stephen Koch. Okay. Uh, he was a snowboarder, snowboard mountaineer. When you say close calls, as in what? Uh, the first one was a Serac fall and we couldn't really see it because we were climbing at night. We could just hear it until essentially it was within the range of our headlamps hmm. and uh, this big wall. I think a huge Sarek had collapsed and it had probably fallen over a mile by the time it reached us. Hmm. And I just saw the air blast coming and I was tied to Steven. And, um, you know, we're in this massive glacier with huge crevasses, so there's nowhere to run. We're tied together. And he just dropped down and dug his snow, his ice axe in, and I just stood there because I was like, it's done anyways. <laughs> and I got picked up and I f was flown like a kite for about 30 seconds Whoa. just from the air blast yeah. and then fell to the ground. And when it all settled and we realized what happened, there were probably, you know, car-sized blocks within 100 feet of us, which is not very far when something's yeah. falling that far. And then later on, long story short, this entire face avalanched right after we got off of it. Um, but... Double whammy. Yeah. Anyways, there's there's um, climbing Everest with Ed Easters and David Brashears was very memorable. Um, and then I went back a couple years after that and climbed it and skied it. So skiing Everest was pretty memorable. And then um, skiing it from what height? Uh, from the summit. You skied from the summit of Everest? Yes. Ah. Daryl, I thought I've got to see that. that. I, well, uh, I knew you had skied Everest. I didn't realize it was. Right from the summit. Yeah, no, a lot of people say they skied Everest, but they skied like <laughs> from halfway down the Lhotse face or, you know. So when you ski from the summit of Everest, how, how far down did you uh, go? You, you skied at the, we skied as far as we could through the Kumbu Icefall. Wow. Until we had to like down climb the That's amazing. ladders and stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of distinctions. I think Everest is one of those things where people are like, I've been on Everest or I've... <laughs> done Everest, that could mean going to base camp. Yeah. You know? So it's it's you, kind of an interesting thing. Um, it's a lot of semantics. Now what about K2? Have uh, no, I've never been to K2. I had some aspirations for K2, but um, you know, my focus really became 
climbing technical routes right and alpine kind of routes um now we, yeah how about big walls are, are you, you do yeah that? okay because yeah i interviewed mark sanat here yeah i've done and he's a few one big of the walls. best big wall climbers in the world I, i've done a few trips with the mark in yeah. fact um we did a trip to borneo where we climbed a new route on a big wall in mount right. kinabalu where else did we go we've been to chad and we've been to um pitcairn island i've been doing a lot of trips with mark he's a wild man he is. I mean, some of his stories he told me about his tent blowing uh, back and forth in nasty storms, yeah. hanging from the highest wall in the world, just yeah. seemed like pure insanity. But Mark, he mm -hmm. just, he, he needs to feed the rat like you do. Yeah, Mark is probably <laughs> one of the best, like one of the greatest but least known explorers of our time, I think. Well, I asked so. Mark, you know, what kind of skills and personality does it take to get on your level, you know, as a climber. Uh -huh. And I wanted to get your opinion on that, and then I'll tell you what he shared with me as far as what he felt the most important trait was. What, what is your most important trait, would you say, as, as a mountaineer? Uh -huh. That gets you to the top when other people turn back or won't even think about going any further. <laughs> Optimism. <laughs> Optimism. <laughs> you have to believe right. that you're actually going to make it. Okay. Because as soon as you stop believing, then it doesn't really, there's, nah, it doesn't really happen. Well, Mark uh, t told me that it was determination. He just yeah. had such sheer determination yeah. that nothing was ever going to get in his way, more yeah. or less. And I'm sure you. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Would add that to your list, too. But Those are all pretty important. Yeah. Well, what are some of the biggest risks that people should be aware of when you're climbing like you are? Um, are you more concerned about avalanches? Because we're hearing so much about them in the news nowadays. Um, or are there other, uh, other things that um, you're more concerned about? Um, I would say that avalanches are the most difficult to manage in terms of a risk and every time that I've almost well maybe not every time but I would say the majority of the times I've almost kicked the bucket it's from avalanches yeah. and are you noticing more and more of them now because of global warming mm, I don't think it's global warming I mean there's it, it can affect potentially the movement of seracs and glaciers. Um, but in terms of kind of, there's a lot of different types of avalanches, right? So there's serac fall, there's a a glacier collapse, like, you know, but um, in terms of slab avalanches and skiing, you know, that's... Uh, but that's aren't conditions thing. getting more unstable up there in the highest mountains of the world because of... There yeah. is global warming going on. Yeah, I think that it can destabilize, but I'm talking about a lot of people that I know that have died in avalanches are from, you know, slab avalanches. Right. On of, ski slopes. Of course, there's yeah. other kinds so, of avalanches. Um, you know. Well, have you had any real close calls with life threatening situations? Yeah. I. <laughs> a few. Tell us about one or two. Um, probably the most recent and probably the most harrowing was a couple years ago when I got um, avalanched up in the Tetons and I went for 2,000 vertical feet um, in a massive mm. avalanche. 2,000? Yeah. Class 3. Class 3 avalanche is basically, def it's defined by an avalanche that would take out like a small town. So. I wasn't really supposed to survive it, but... Um, now, what do you do when you to survive an avalanche? You have special kinds of equipment with you, right? Uh, when you get buried under snow? And an avalanche like that, it's d divine intervention. <laughs> That's divine. the tool. <laughs> well, I figure... It, I don't know. I mean, it's... Well, aren't you supposed to have some kind of uh, device that gives off signals so people yeah, can I mean, find you yeah, at least? But, uh, <laughs> and then I thought that maybe long tubes or something no. for breathing, if you could possibly get <laughs> get it out of the snow. No, no um, avalanche beacons are there to. In an avalanche like that, an avalanche beacon is basically for body recovery. But um, yeah, 
So, uh, so how did you? What happened when you were buried? It fell down two thousand feet. How did um, it all end up? Well, I survived. Well, yeah, barely. Um, no injuries. Mm, nope, no significant injuries. Hmm. But you were very lucky. I was very lucky. What was the other uh, close call? I mean, I mean, you've had a number, I gather, but I don't know. another one that rings. <laughs> it's a like, um, have you ever slipped <laughs> off a rock ledge? Because the reason I'm asking is, <laughs> yes, because I've always felt that being a mountaineer and a photographer is is much more dangerous than just being a mountaineer. Yeah. I, I truly believe that. I've known well, a number of... Yeah. No, you have to definitely, because you have to, you only have so much bandwidth, right? And so your comfort level is such that, like, you need to have a certain comfort level where you give yourself enough space in your brain to think about shooting. Um, but comfort level can be a dangerous thing, obviously. Yeah. So you just have to stay focused and... Um, be very calculated, and I think... Because um, as a mountaineer, really, the, the focus is always on really concentrating on every move, every step, mm -hmm. every being totally aware of everything that's around you at all times. Mm -hmm. uh, and w when you're doing what you're doing, you're sort of spending half your time doing that, but the other half thinking about, how am I going to get this yeah. next great photograph? So yep. it seems like maybe your focus and concentration on the climbing part of it could let yeah. up at times. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, you, you just have to, I mean, I do a lot of training. I mean, first part is just the physical aspect because if you're tired, then everything starts to fall apart. So you yeah. just have to like. Stay well, on I greatly top of admire it. what you do, and yeah. uh, I think it's fantastic that you've emerged to the top of the world in this unique and yeah. profession. <laughs> and um, by the way, who, how yeah. do you market your photos, and, and who ends up buying them? Um, it just depends. I, you know, I've shot for the North Face for a long time. I've had like a very consistent client. So. Um, that but was it's Mark's just time. Big, uh, Mark Sinat's uh, sponsored yeah. North Face. Yeah, yeah, they're good. Yeah. So I just, I just work hard and hope that the photography, you know, speaks for itself, and hope that um, I, I'm very fortunate. You know, I've had some really good breaks and people that helped me out along the way. And, well, you're um, inspiring a lot of people worldwide. So oh, we thanks. hope you continue to do what you do for a long time to come. You're, you're still very young. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to think that. <laughs> um, any big project uh, in the works right now or in uh, the future? Yeah, I'm just finishing a film, feature-length documentary, um, and I've been putting a lot of effort into that. And so uh, that's kind of the big project. And then I have a new daughter, so that's like a big project. Congratulations. <laughs> so... Are you allowed to say what the documentary is about? Or? Yeah, it's about Mount Meru, a climb that we did a few years ago. Mount um, Meru. Now, yeah. where is that? It's in northern India. Oh, yeah, that's not too Garwal, far from Himalaya. where I was. So is that near um, Kashmir? Or? Uh, no, just um, north of Gangotri. Okay. In the Garhwal. Oh, so. so I'll have to see that documentary for yeah. sure. Yeah, should be good. All right, Jimmy. Well, thanks so much. It was yeah. great talking to you, and for we're sure. excited to see your presentation tonight. Great.